Maharaj Parikshit wants to get guidance from the, the sages, and particularly Sukadeva Goswami is going to come and he will be elected as the person who is the most qualified to guide him. All right, so this is the uh, No. Uh, okay, wait. So this is the first canto. So the second canto then begins with uh, Sukadeva Goswami is appreciating the words of Maharaj Parikshit. So here you can see we've taken a statement from Srila Prabhupada's lecture from the first verse. If you look at the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, would someone like to read it for me, please? Question? Yeah. Oh, no. Read from the, the book. The first canto, the second canto, first chapter, first verse. Pisuka vacha, bariyan esati prasnaha, kruta loka hitam rupa, atmam vi sammataha pumsam, kruta bhyadi sujaha paraha. Yes, translation. Pisuka de Goswami said, my dear king, your question is glorious because it is very beneficial to all kinds of people. The answer to this question is a prime subject matter for hearing and it is approved by all transcendentalists. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. Yes. Okay, Madhiji, would you like to read here Prabhupada's quote? Yes, Prabhu. Nice, Maharaj. Lokhitam. Because this Bhagavad is so nice, transcendental subject matter, discussed about Krishna, it is Lokhita. It should be spread all over the world. Loka does not mean your country or your society, Brahmana society, Goswami society. No. Lokhita, for the benefit of the whole world, that is Lokhita. Not only of this world, but other worlds also. Of the whole universe, Lokhita, Nripa. My dear king, your Krishna. So this message of Srimad Bhagavatam should be spread all over the world. Srila Prabhupada lectured Srimad Bhagavatam 211 Vrindavan 1974. Oh, thank you very much. Very nice. So, Loka Hitam, this is for the benefit of the whole world. Not, 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 not the world, not only the world, the whole universe. <laughs> So the Srimad Bhagavatam should be spread everywhere. So this is uh, the, the appreciation of Maharaj Parishit's question. Right? What was the question? Who remembers what was Maharaj Parishit's question? Maharaj, uh, uh. Parikshit Maharaj asked that what is the unalloyed duty of everyone in all circumstances, especially when someone is about to die. Right. Thank you very much. Yes. So this is the subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm. One of the devotees here in Mayapur, he would joke about it. He would say that... Uh, some people, they, they follow the thing called the art of living. He said, we follow the art of dying. And he said, this Srimad Bhagavatam is all about dying, how to prepare for death. <laughs> so, here you can see that this uh, point is being made, actually. It's a serious matter. People in general, they don't know, they have no idea, they never thought about it. A, what, what is a duty in death? People, all, they only think about living. When they get sick, they don't think, oh, I'm going to die. They're only thinking how to save themselves, how to prolong their life. 
they go running to the doctors and they're begging the doctors. And Srila Prabhupada, <coughs> Prabhupada told himself how uh, someone he knew had gone to the doctors and the doctor told him, oh, you have this terrible disease, you know, you're going to die soon. And the man begged the doctor, oh, doctor, please give me four more years. I need to finish my work. And the doctor just laughed. He said, four more years. He said, I cannot do that. He said, I don't have that power. So this is the typical situation in the material world, that nobody wants to die, but death is inevitable. But death, of course, is simply the changing of the body. People don't understand what is death. And they don't understand also how to prepare for death. They simply think how to prolong their life. They want to live forever. So they all have that kind of mentality that they think they can live forever. Okay, so. All right, the topics of Lord Krishna are so auspicious that they purify the speaker, the hearer, and the inquirer. They are compared to the Ganges waters, which flow from the toe of Lord Krishna. Wherever the Ganges waters go, they purify the land and the person who bathes in them. Similarly, the topics of Krishna are so pure that wherever they are spoken, the place, the hearer, the inquirer, the speaker, and all concerned become purified. From the purport of the first verse of the first chapter of the second canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is the power of speaking topics of Krishna that it's beneficial for everyone. The speaker benefits by speaking topics of Krishna, the speaker benefits, and then the hearer who had inquired. And of course, in this particular case, it was Sukadeva Goswami, the speaker, and Maharaj Parikshit is the hearer. And the audience was also there. The great sages who had all come to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. And so many sages had come. So Srila Prabhupada makes the point how these topics of Lord Krishna are compared to the Ganges water. And just as the Ganges water purifies everything, so the topics of Krishna purify everything. And Prabhupada had one sister, uh, Didi, uh, what was the name? Didi, Didi, Diti, huh? Dim, huh? Pishama, Pishama her name was, Pishama. So Pishama, she used to always carry a little bottle of Ganges water and she would always be sprinkling Ganges water everywhere, everywhere. After somebody had sat down and then they got up, she'd sprinkle Ganga water. All, she always had a bottle of Ganges water with her and she was always sprinkling it. So, better than Ganges water is topics of Krishna, because it can benefit everyone, the speaker, the hearer, and the audience. Okay, so, Sukadeva Goswami goes on to speak about the nature of materialistic life. And he talks about householders and we learn that there are two kinds of householders. We have the Grihastas and the Grihamedis. So the Grihastas are those who live in family life with, as an ashram and their purpose in family life is for spiritual advancement. But there are other classes of householders who are Grihamedis. So 
we want to hear from you. What are some of these symptoms of the Grihamedis which uh, distinguish them from the Grihastas? Hmm. Grihamedis, they do not do spiritual advancement, they do not give charity, they do not do austerity, and they do not follow the Shastras. Well, you know, I don't know if you're quite correct about that. You say they do not give charity. You know, there are Grihamedis who give charity, but they will give charity for material purposes. You see? It's not spiritual. It's not... It's, as you know, in Bhagavad Gita, charity can be in the mode of passion and in the mode of ignorance. And so Grihamedis, they can give charity. So I would be cautious about, you know, if you say they don't give charity, I think, you know, Graham Hades, they, they could give charity, but they could also be Graham Hades, that they're giving charity for their own material benefit, not for the, the pleasure of Krishna, not, as a, not for their purification. Do you agree? Yes, Maharaj, yes, I beg. Okay, so what what were some of the other points which you said about Grihas Grihamedis, the symptoms? They do not follow the, the principles of the Vedic literature, Vedic follow, um, Vedic scriptures. Mm. They do not have time. They have only time for earning money. So mm. they have very less time for spiritual uh, development. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're very much concerned for money, right? They will they'll, they'll make great efforts to get money, that's definitely there. They want money for their own sense gratification. They're eager to get money for their own sense gratification. You know, they may do Vedic, they may do Vedic yagyas, and you know, the Vedas are often, there's Karmakanda, activities there in the Vedas. So Grihamedis, they could also be doing Karmakandi activities. You know, their purpose is not for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. They want some material benefit. And so there's also Grihamedi mentality. They're pious, but it's still, <laughs> they're still Grihamedi. Right? Medi meaning envious. The Griha is the home and Medi is the envy. They have this envy towards others. And they see that others have got some, something better than them, that they're more opulently situated, they're enjoying more their material life and they feel envious of them. So that's it, the Griha Medi, that they tend to be envious of others and they'll always try to compete and want to do better than others. Yeah? Someone else would like to contribute here about the symptoms of Grihamedes? They like to hear about many subject topics um, other than spirituality. Yes. Yes. They're, they're, they like to watch Bollywood movies. They'll, they'll watch movies for hours, and uh, they'll watch the cricket match for hours. But if there's a Bhagavad Kata, they can hardly sit for ten minutes. All right. And so that's that's one of the features of Grihamedis. They can spend so much money when they go to the mall. But you ask them to give donation for the temple, oh, I have no money. That's a great Maharaj, they are blind to spiritual knowledge. Yeah. And they are materially engrossed and they want only a sense gratification. Uh -huh. Yes, they are blind to spiritual knowledge and they are eager for their own sense gratification. They're very much attached to their family, their family, own family members. Everything is centered around the family. The center of their enjoyment is all their own little family and their materialistic life. So these are 
common symptoms of the Grihamedis. So Sukadeva Goswami is describing how these Grihamedis have many subject matters for hearing and chanting, but they're, they're not inclined to hear about Krishna. But they have many other things to talk about. They're very busy and gossiping. We see everywhere people have their talking and mobile phones and talking back and forth. So they're very anxious for all of this. So in this way, Sukadeva Goswami is describing the Grihamedi. Uh, so Sukadeva Goswami is replying to Maharaj Pariksha's question. He, he wants to explain, first of all, what we should not do. Before he explains what we should do, he first of all says well, what we shouldn't do. And he says we shouldn't waste our precious human life. We shouldn't waste our valuable human life. One second loss can never be brought back. Right? So that's one thing. And how do we waste our valuable human life? Well, one way is by hearing all these mundane topics. By hearing the news, the gossip, the politics, what's going on everywhere, what's going on in the next house and the next street, what's going on in the next city, and hearing everything from everywhere else. We like to hear all the mundane news, what's the gossip. So this is Gramya Kata, and this is very detrimental, very harmful to our Krishna consciousness. We hear all the nonsense, our heart will become polluted. And then the other symptom of the Grihamedis, anxious, very anxious to get money, running after money the whole day. What to speak the whole day, they'll run the whole night as well. In some places people have not one job, not two jobs, but three jobs. They have a job in the day, a job in the night, and then a job on the weekend. And then you get ladies, you know, that maybe they're a maid. The one lady, she's a maid, she goes to one house and she does all the work. Then she goes to another house and, she, and she's got like four or five houses. Every day she'll go and do the work there. This way she's making, get, collecting income from four or five different houses in one day every day. So very eager to make money. They're anxious to get money and what's it money for? It's all just for their sense gratification, for the education, for the car, for the new home, uh, oh, so many things we think we need. And then also, we shouldn't waste our time just simply sleeping, or then sexual indulgence. So sleeping, people like to sleep a lot. They, we should be regulated, be careful. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna said, don't eat too much or eat too little, and don't sleep too much or sleep too little. So sleep sufficient, don't sleep more, don't sleep less. Be careful, be regulated. And then taking, taking shelter of the fallible soldiers. Who are the fallible soldiers? Can someone tell me? Wife, children, relatives. Yes, Prabhu. Wife, children, relatives, money, power. Body. Why are they called fallible? Because they're temporary. And we cannot rely on them. They will not take us back to Godhead. All right. They won't take us back to Godhead. They cannot save us at the time of death. Of course, if they're devotees, they can help us to remember Krishna at the time of death. But materialistic families, generally, they, they don't do that. And so they're, they're just fallible soldiers. And, and often they're waiting for people to die so that they can get the money 
that all oh, good is gone, now we can enjoy his money. <laughs> that mentality is there. And when somebody goes from the family, then all the family members will fight over the property, who should get what and how much they should get. In this way, constant fighting and arguing. So people with the material world, we tend to take shelter of the family members. And just like a king lives in a castle and he has his army there, his guards there to protect him. And so in the same way, every the man, materialistic man, lives at home and he's surrounded by his family members. And the family members are all there to, and he thinks they will protect me from death. No one will, can come. My family are all here. And just like dogs. When somebody comes to the door, then the dog will bark. The dog is saying, why are you coming here? I'm already here. So the soldiers are there to protect the elderly people. <laughs> but of course, the soldiers are hopeless. They cannot conquer over death. Cruel death comes and takes everyone from this world. So here's a quote from Srila Prabhupada. He's talking about the materialistic people. He said, they are blind. They are thinking that these things will give him protection. Pramata. Pramata means crazy. Crazy. By craziness, he is thinking these things will give me protection. From Srimad Bhagavatam lecture on the fifth verse of the first chapter of the second canto. So what things will give me protection? What, are, what is being talked about here when they say these things will give me protection? Harinam Maharaj? No, no. These things will give me... Body. Body, wife, and children. Yes, the wife, the children, the servants, the dogs, the, the money, the home. They, are they going to protect you? No, no, no. They're not going to protect you. They're not going to save you. But people are so pramata, they're so crazy. They're thinking they will protect us. So here you can see the soldiers, <laughs> fallible soldiers. Poor guys in the desert there, you can see. Tough life to be there in the desert like that. So Prabhupada says, someone like to read for us? Who's not read? I can read Maharaj. Go ahead then. Uh, mission. They'll devote the whole day for reading this newspaper or some fiction or some novels for this and that. But they have no time to hear Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, Apashitam, Atma Tattvam, because they have no interest in self-realization. People have lost all interest. This is the position. Therefore, this Krishna consciousness movement is essential at the present moment. Srila Prabhupada's lecture, Srimad Bhagavatam, 1.5.22 Vrindavan. So, what is the meaning of Pashyatam Atma Tadvam? Ignoring, ignoring to the uh, self-realization. Right, that they're blind, they're ignorant to self-real, to the Atma Tadva, to the science of the soul. So this is the situation. So how important is the Krishna Consciousness Movement, Prabhupada's mission? to give people some knowledge. We distribute books, we try to awaken people. All right, so here we've, we've broken down the first section of this chapter, these first 14 verses where Sukadeva Goswami is preaching to Maharaj Parikshit. So he said in the first four verses, and two, three, four, he was saying what we shouldn't do. So then five and six, he starts to describe what everyone should do. What everyone should do, right? What should they do? 
Text 5 and 6. Someone can read the verse 5 and 6. Just read the translation. Tasma Dharata Sarvatma Bhagavan Ishwara Hari Pratabya Kritita Vyascha Mata Vyascha Ichatam Avayam. O descendant of King Bharata, one who desires to be free from all miseries must hear about, glorify, and also remember the personality of Godhead, who is the super soul, the controller, and the savior from all miseries. Okay, so that's what we should do. We should hear about, glorify, and remember the personality of Godhead. And then, text 7 to 10, then he speaks about, Sukadeva Goswami speaks about hearing and chanting is, is the activity of liberated souls. He talks about, yeah, uh, could you read text 7, Prabhu? Text 7? No, 7. Text 7. O King Parikit, mainly the topmost transcendent leaves who are above the regulative principles and restrictions take pleasure in describing the glories of the Lord. All right. And so even the, the liberated souls, the advanced transcendentalists, they take pleasure in hearing and chanting. And then you can see text number 8 and 9, Sukadev Goswami just gives himself as an example that Sukadeva Goswami is a liberated soul. From his very birth, he's liberated. He, after taking birth, he'd been in the womb, first of all, for uh, 16 years. And then when he came out, he immediately left home. So he's a liberated soul from birth. But he was attracted to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. And that is shown to us, that was stated by the Atmarama Sloka. Right? You studied the Atmarama verse? in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that those people, even those who are Atmarama, who are taking pleasure in the Self, they are attracted to hear the glories of the Lord. And Sukadeva Goswami himself was attracted to that. And then text 10, qualifications for and benefits from hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam. Qualifications. Not everyone is going to be able to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. Some people are just not ready for it. They're not qualified. And then he will also describe what is the benefit of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. The, the Srimad Bhagavatam is very purifying. So like that. Then text 11, the way of success. And 12 to 14, the good fortune of Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Parikshit is certainly fortunate. And we will hear, we may think, oh, he's unfortunate, he's cursed to die. But actually, he's very fortunate. And Sukadeva Goswami is going to convince him of his good fortune. How, how fortunate he is, that although he's cursed to die, he is so fortunate, he's got seven days to focus entirely on hearing topics of Krishna in the association of Sukadeva Goswami and many other great sages. So he is really fortunate. Okay, so we ask you, what kind of, what, what qualifications do you think are required to properly hear Srimad Bhagavatam. You know, people come sometimes, you know, you, you're, maybe you've had experience yourself, maybe you have to give class, 
and you give class to the audience and you look at the audience and you see somebody is sitting, they got their mobile phone in their hand and they're playing with their mobile phone and they're working their mobile phone and, and you're talking, but you can tell then although they're in the class, they're not really, their attention is not really on the class. Although physically they may be there, but they're not actually hearing. So another kind of hearer, somebody's there, you know, and, and they're sitting and their eyes are closed and they're not moving. <laughs> so it happened, it happened one time, at least one time, and Prabhupada was giving class and, you know, the devotee was sitting there and, uh, and Prabhupada noticed him and Prabhupada said to him, you're sleeping. And Prabhupada, he, the, the devotee immediately sat up and said, Prabhupada, I'm not sleeping. And Prabhupada said, you are sleeping. He said, no Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I wasn't sleeping. So Prabhupada said to him, if your eyes are closed and you're not moving, then you are asleep. <laughs> so this was Prabhupada's argument that he didn't appreciate devotees to sit with their eyes closed and not moving. He liked to see that they were alert and hearing. So qualifications of an ideal hearer, th 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 they should give proper attention to hearing. Uh, what do you think, some of you, some kind of reaction to that? what kind of qual what, what do you feel is a good qualification for an ideal hearer? Um, Maharaj, what I feel is that um, they should be sincere and eager to hear the message of, you know, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. If they are there present, it's just not, you know, they should be mentally and physically present. So they should be sincere and eager. Yes, that's a good qualification. I think that was mentioned also in the first chapter of the first canto, right? Yes, Maharaj. That eagerness to hear, yeah, that's a very good, a very important quality of a hearer, that they're very eager to hear. Nobody forced them, <laughs> right? They came on their own. Good. Yeah, the eagerness. Anything else, Prabhu? Maharaj, you should not ask challenging questions like to test the speaker that you know, does he have good knowledge. You should have full faith. I hear it. Mm, okay, yes. We shouldn't. Prabhupada talks about that in the Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter 34. Because in chapter 434, Lord Krishna is describing try to learn the truth by approaching the spiritual master and inquire from him. Right? Tadvidi pranipatena pari prashnena sevaya. And that we're encouraged to put questions to the speaker. But this, the questions, Prabhupada said, the questions should not be of a challenging nature. And they shouldn't be ridiculous either. And so, of course, Prabhupada sometimes would have to deal with these kind of things. Oh, yeah. Challenging questions. People want to know, what, what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, these kind of stupid questions. And then the other challenging question, can God make a stone so heavy that even he can't lift it? And so this kind of things, this kind of stupid and challenging questions. So hearers shouldn't, you know, should, shouldn't put these kind of questions. Yes, okay. Anything else? Hare yes, Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Please. Okay, Prabhu. I should have Guru and Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, one more thing I remember I heard in one of our senior duties lecture is like uh, somebody should hear to transform the heart. They should it should be like uh, the pearl, you know, like the it goes the drop goes and then becomes a pearl. It should not be that the drop falls on some hot metal and it evaporates. So the knowledge that we are hearing, we should retain it in our heart and 
you know utilize that and apply that knowledge uh, to transform our being uh, rather than just hear and forget yes right yeah we say go in one ear and out the other right <laughs> In one ear, out the other. Nothing is retained. It should go to the heart, right? Okay, good. We should retain. Sometimes we ask people, what was the class about? And they say, oh, then I forget. <laughs> they didn't remember anything from the class. Nothing remember. Nothing went in. So, yeah, we should try to absorb something from the classes. Hearing. We should hear with careful attention. Yes, anything else? Yes, Mara, so Service. the person, person should not be envious and a professional preacher by learning uh, the, this knowledge, he should not use it for preaching and making money out of it. Okay, yes. We shouldn't have the business mentality in presenting. Sometimes, you know, some some speakers, they will put on a performance. You get some people, they can, they can, they're very good at crying in front of the audience, and they put on a dramatic performance. And so that's the speaker. What about the hearer? You know, we're talking about qualifications of a hearer. They should have a service attitude and they should be respectfully hearing Srimad Yes, very good. Yes, service attitude, the attitude there. Mm. Service attitude and submissively hearing. He yes, he Prabhu? Be, he should be receptive, open to understand the new or the open to understand. He, he should be receptive when he is hearing. All right, receptivity. Right. Okay, so we'll go ahead. They be... Yes, Manaji? They shouldn't be hearing in a challenging mood. Yes, right. We mentioned that. They shouldn't be challenging. Okay, so then we'll go on and we want to hear about this uh, statement which was made by Sukadeva Goswami. He was describing about chanting the holy name, Hari Nam Anukirtanam. Hari Nam Anukirtanam, meaning constant chanting of the holy name. As Srila Sridhar Swami, the, one, the original commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam, he said that there's no other method of self-realization which, which can be more beneficial than this. This meaning Hari Nam Anukirtanam, constant chanting of the holy name. That's very beneficial. And Srila Jiva Goswami, he said, he's added a condition, one must avoid Nama Parad in order to achieve the ultimate result of chanting. Right? So this is a condition to the chanting. You may chant, uh, we say one may chant the holy name for many births, but if we, we don't avoid offences, then we won't get the goal of the chanting. We won't get love of God. But you can go on chanting for many births, but you'll never get the, if, if we're still chanting with offences. So we have to be very cautious. To avoid offences. And here's a quote from Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He says that among the angas of bhakti, hearing, chanting and remembering are the three chief ones. This has been stated in verse 5. Among those three, chanting is the chief. So there are nine angas of bhakti. We know there are nine angas of bhakti, so Sukadeva Goswami wanted to clarify how exactly, what is the most powerful, mo most potent form of bhakti to engage in. So he particularly mentioned hearing, 
chanting and remembering. And now, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is seeing that among the three, the most, the best, the most important is chanting. Because where chanting is performed properly, there will be also hearing and remembering. It will be included within the chanting. If we do the chanting properly, without offence, with full attention, then we will also hear and we will also remember. It's all included within chanting. So in this way, the chanting is the most important, the chief of all the nine processes of devotion. And such chanting should be anukirtan, constant, following in the footsteps of previous authorities and according to the level of one's realizations. So constant chanting. Of course, that's also mentioned in Shikshastikam by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He says, Kirtaniya Sadahari. Always chant the holy name. So here also in Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadeva Goswami, long before Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance, Sukadeva Goswami had also said, Hari Manu Kirtanam, constant chanting of the holy name is recommended. And Jiva Goswami is telling us, watch out for the offences. All right, someone like to read the verse for us? Text number 11 on the slide. Chetan nirvidya mana naam vichyatama kuto bhayam yogi naam nipanirnitam hare nama anukirtanam Okay, constant chanting of the holy name of the Lord after the ways of the great authorities is a doubtless and fearless way of success for all, including those who are free from all material desires those who are desirous of the material enjoyment, and also those who are of self satisfied by dream of transcendental knowledge. Yes, good. Okay. So, an exercise for you. Discuss with a partner how to proactively counteract offences to the holy name. Right? We know there are ten offences in chanting the holy name. We recite them, maybe you recite them every morning in the temples, we often do that. If you stay in the temple in the morning after Mangal Arti, we recite the ten offences. So how to avoid committing these offences to the holy name? What is some, have you got some strategy? We ask you, write down the main ideas for sharing them with the rest of the class. All right, so can we give you a, what, five minutes to just do something on this? How, about the, how many people are here? Is it 12? 25, Maharaj. Huh? 25, Maharaj. Oh, everybody came in? Yes, Maharaj. Not so many, huh? Okay. So, can uh, we'll have groups of two and one group of three? Um, sure, Maharaj. I'll just create out the breakout rooms just in a minute. Just for five minutes. Uh, Maharaj, should we divide each of the offense between the teams or every team can choose any offense? Any offence you can choose, yes. You know, I want you to take your break at this time also. Okay. We'll give you 10 minutes so that in the course of this 10 minutes you can take a break. You can have your break. So 5 minutes break and 5 minutes for this exercise. So we'll come back in 10 minutes. I'll give you some time to think about this. Defense against Nam Aparad. Yes, any offense. 
so all the breakout rooms are now open um, okay very good Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhamkala Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. My obeisance is all glory is Prabhupada. I can't hear you, Maharaj. I cannot hear me. Am I muted? Oh, I'm muted. Oh, okay. I'm muted. Sorry. Oh, okay. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, only both of us, Maharaj. Yeah, I don't see anybody else here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so I don't know about you, but the biggest obstacle for me in my chanting is uh, my I, I get distracted. You know, the, my mind wanders and the focus on start thinking about other things. Same as me, Maharaj. Um, and uh, I, I also get distracted, but uh, towards the morning, but when I chant in the morning, uh, after after I, I, I do my prayers and uh, I take my bath, apply tilak and everything, uh, it's very nice, Maharaj. But uh, towards uh, the day and the evening, uh, it runs, it runs a lot. And, uh, it's definitely better to chant in the morning. Although you can chant any time, but still I find it much better to chant early in the morning. The rounds which I... Oh, Hare Krishna, someone else has joined our group here. So I find it definitely it helps to chant early in the morning. In the evening, you know, so many things have gone on and, you know, so many thoughts will be in the mind. It's, even in the morning, so many things are in the mind, but it's much worse in the evening. So I try to, I try to do more, ch much more chanting early in the morning. Some people, you know, they, they don't have time to chant in the morning. They do all their chanting in the evening. When do you chant? I normally try to chant in the morning, Maharaj. Uh, but sometimes if I am busy, then, uh, you know, I have to go in the morning, I don't have the time, then I try to do it in the evening. Mm, yeah, yeah. What about you, Maharaj? Maharaj, I try my best to chant in the morning. If not, then I punish myself by doing double rounds the next day. <laughs> Not as a punishment, but as a bliss, you know, like, uh, like the Dhanda Mahatsa. <laughs> so it's like bliss of chanting. I, chant, I train my mind if I don't wake up. So you chant, what, the, the next morning? Uh, no, if I just want like, that, not if, if um, I am not able to wake up on time, then I'll complete today's round, but next morning I'll chant double the rounds. 
Okay. But what about that day? Did you get the rounds finished still? Yes, Saraj. Just finish them during the daytime, eh? Yes, Saraj. Okay. So, do you, have, do you have any particular obstacle in your chanting? What's your biggest obstacle? I think uh, hearing the syllables, Maharaj, and focusing on them. Like hearing each and every Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Right now it's like, like you know, actually um, hearing it properly. And yeah. the mind... The mind wanders, huh? the inattention. Yes, it goes here and there. Mm. Well, they say loud chanting helps. You chant loud. Yes, loud chant. Try to chant loudly. And of course, also the... In Recording in progress. It, it seems like uh, the time for the breakout room got over, so we are back to the main session now. The five minutes is done. <laughs> Uh, Maharaj, you are muted. Please uh, uh, unmute yourself, Maharaj. Okay, yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Just a five minute break. Um, we can start with room one. Um, it, wa it had Iskhan Paniyati and Premanand Gopinath Prabhu. Mm -hmm. Mataji, you could not uh, speak to each other. <laughs> it seems uh, yeah oh it shows that Prabhuji didn't join like you joined but Prabhuji didn't only one person <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Group, two can go on. group 2 was Ashwini Shinde Mataji Chaitanya Hari Prabhu and Nalima Mataji well, only two of us there <clears throat> so I think uh, uh, we discussed how we, we have to uh, keep our mind focused especially uh, fix the time for chanting so that it, uh, for, so that we can we will be able to appreciate the fixed time and also second thing is uh, Mataji was also highlighting even when we deal with uh, devotees or even outsiders especially when preaching we have to be gentle not to offense anybody so that that incident might not interfere in our chanting so this is the main two, two things that we discuss uh, Mataji you can add in anything uh, yes, Roji, I want to add one more point that uh, we should keep uh, ourselves away from the gadgets such as mobile so that we can uh, be focusing on our chanting and our chanting will not be inattentive chanting. That is also one of the offenses, no? Out of 10 offenses. So, yeah, that what, uh, that's what I wanted to add in that. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yeah, I think that's a, a very important point. You have to be very careful about these mobile devices. They're very distracting. And it's a good idea to put them far away or even turn them off when you do your japa. Just get in the habit to just do your japa far away from your telephone. And leave it aside. And first do your japa. The first and the most important thing is the japa. Either turn off your mobile telephone or keep it away, keep it far away, out of reach. But don't keep it with you. Don't be... You know, sometimes people have the bead bag in one hand and the mobile phone in the other hand. <laughs> and, and the attention is more on the mobile than on the japa. It's, it's not good. Someone else? So, uh, Maharaj Group 3 had you and D.T. Surya Kumar Prabhu in Pastor Maharaj. Alright. So, uh, Surya Kumar Surya Prabhu. Surya Kumar Prabhu. Sorry, I was unmuted. Okay, um, I was actually uh, uh, having this problem of uh, uh, the mind is actually not, uh, it, it runs while I chant. And um, I find it difficult to actually bring it back. But uh, there's a difference when I actually do the chanting uh, early in the morning, uh, especially uh, uh, 
during that stipulated time, uh, one and a half hours before sunrise, uh, or to be specific, after Mangla Arti. And uh, that chanting is actually quite effective uh, as compared to uh, the evening chanting, especially on Japa, and uh, the mind gets distracted. So, uh, size on the morning chanting. Yes. After Mandar. Yes, very good. Yes, it's good advice. Take advantage of the auspicious time, the Brahma Muhurta in the early morning before the sunrise. It's a very auspicious period to do our um, Japa meditation. And all different spiritual faiths and meditation groups they often have that program the early morning prayers. So temples, they have Mangal Arti. So before Mangal Arti, take advantage, try to chant some rounds before the Mangal Arti and after Mangal Arti also. It's more powerful. Later on in the day, so many more thoughts are there to distract the mind. So try to make that our business of the early morning hours. And we also said loud chanting helps. Yes, Maharaj. Whenever we have difficulty in hearing each and every syllable of Hare Krishna Mahantra, so Maharaj kindly recommended that in such case, loud chanting helps. So it trains the mind that way. Haridas Thakur and Kolaveka Sridhar and these people, they all ch they chanted loudly. <laughs> They didn't chant softly. They didn't chant in the mind. Loud, loud chanting. And that way more people get the benefit. Everyone who hears, they benefit. <laughs> of course, you have to consider time and place and circumstance. Your family may not appreciate. <laughs> Are there anything else? Uh, Maharaj, uh, room 4 had Diksha Mataji and Namkirti Mataji and room 6 had Dayalakshmi Mataji and Sachinandana Hande Prabhuji. So after room 4, um, room 6 can present. Yes. Anything else to add from these groups? Yes, Maharaj. Krishna Maharaj, I, uh, I and Namkirti Mataji tried to take one man of pens of the holy name and we try to write a positive from that. So, like the first one is to bless them, the devotees. So, we thought that we'll be glorifying the devotees, write some gratitude to them. And uh, by this, we can try to come and try to associate with like minded devotees while chanting. Second, uh, to consider the names of demigods like Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma to be equal. For that, we thought we'll be respectful to the demigods and uh, we will pray for pure devotional service to them. And third, disobeying the orders of the spiritual master, we will try to associate more with the disciples so that we remember the goal of our initiation and try to follow. The fourth one, to bless me in the Vedic literature, we thought that we'll be reading the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam, that's how important it is, and then we can and try to read more Srimad Bhagavatam. The, regarding the fifth one, to consider the glories of chanting Hare Krishna to be imagination, for that, one can hear from the bona fide spiritual master or one, that devotee who has realizations of holy name, that who is oneself uh, uh, trying to practice sincerely and who has realization. Okay. So one can hear. Okay. Thank you very much. This is also this is nice. You're thinking how to do do good, not to do offense. How to do how to avoid the offenses and. You're correct. Instead of criticizing the devotees, appreciate the devotees. Very good. Very nice. Okay, we have to go ahead. Let's see. Uh, we'll, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll just go ahead. I think there's, we don't want to take any more time on this. Uh, let me see. Here. Inattention. The main offense. Haridas spoke to Lord Chaitanya, inattention is counted as one of the apparats 
even if one successfully overcomes all the other offenses in chanting, and one is chanting continuously, love of God may not come. One should know that the reason for this is that one is committing the offense known as pramada, or inattention. This offense will block progress to prem. So inattention, the main offense, it's the seed of the other, all other offenses. All other offenses come from this one thing, from this inattention. This is the seed of offence. And so we must be very careful to guard against this. Uh, how to avoid inattention? By giving full attention, by focusing the mind to hear. Srila Prabhupada said... Uh, Maharaj's slide is not shared. Huh? Maharaj's slide is not shared if you are sharing uh, Oh, the really? Slide. Oh, yeah. let me see what happened. I'll have to go back. Let me see, where are we? Okay, share the slide. Yes, Maharaj, you can see now. Okay. All right, so this was a quote. This is inattention. All right. We're talking about inattention. This offense, I said, this is the seed of offense. So we have to be very careful with how, how to avoid inattention. We have to give attention and louder chanting. Loud chanting will allow us to give more attention. Srila Prabhupada explains, it's not a question of the mind. You use the ear to hear and the tongue to chant. So don't become absorbed in the mind. This inattention is due to the mind. We're focusing on the mind, our concentration, we're listening to the mind. Instead of hearing the mantra, instead of hearing the holy name, we're just hearing our mind. So this is inattention. We have to be careful to avoid this. All right. The antidote to an uncontrolled mind. Srila Prabhupada says, but there is a quality to such utterances also. It depends on the quality of feeling. From the prayers of Queen Kunti purport. And so chanting, there's quality in chanting. We know there's nam aparad, there's namabhas, shudanam. So there's quality. So the quality depends on the quality of feeling. How much we're feeling for the holy name, we're calling to Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada would say we should call in the mood of a child separated from the mother. That kind of mood. So this kind of feeling. We want to feel close to Krishna. And here we mention about making the effort. We have to try, we have to try for these things. It, it doesn't happen just mechanically, it doesn't happen just on its own. We have to really want to make the effort. So effort is a gateway to bring us from Nama Parad to Nama Bas, when we start to make the effort. And here we put a couple of quotes in also. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati said, unless we extend our best efforts earnestly and qualify ourselves for the Lord's mercy, it is never, it is next to impossible that we can be rescued from our fallen condition. And from the Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter 7, 
text number six. The revival of the dormant affection of love of God does not depend on the mechanical system of hearing and chanting, but it solely and wholly depends on the causeless mercy of the Lord. When the Lord is fully satisfied with the sincere efforts of the devotee, he may endow him with his loving transcendental service. So that, again, the effort, the sincere efforts of the devotee, when Krishna is satisfied, that we really made a great effort to chant the holy name, then Krishna will give his mercy. <laughs> so we point out to you that it's not only the mind, but the physiology also affects the psychology. And the mind is affected. Just like we mentioned, moving our eyes around the room, certainly our mind will be affected. You move the, and we see things in the room, we move the eyes around the room, the mind will be drawn, contemplate the different things in the room. Our chant, while closing our eyes or staring at one object, or sitting calmly, not shaking your body. And so different ways, different things different people do. Some people move, some people shake their body, some people sit very straight, and some people walk around the room. And so many things, different ways people do. So, it affects also our thinking, the way we move, the things we do, is going to affect our thinking. So we are, ask, we are asking you, how can we create a favourable lifestyle for chanting the Holy Name? Chanting the Holy Name is our most important business, it's the most important instruction from the spiritual master. So we, we want to hear from you, what would make a favourable lifestyle which we can do to help us to chant the Holy Name? Now some of you have already, some of you have already mentioned waking up early and getting a good start to the day. If you wake up early in the morning, you can get up early and maybe in time for the Brahma Mahurta and you can do some chanting at that time, then it's very good. Yes, so that's one thing you can do to make chanting successful. Anything else? Marajib is going to say something? Uh, uh, the, way yes. we spend, the way we spend our 22 hours, that will also uh, reflect, be reflected in our next two hours of Japa. So we should be very conscious in our dealings with devotees and even with anybody because that will uh, be reflect, uh, getting reflections there and also we can be read the uh, songs of the Acharya so that we can be more prayerful. Anything we can do, anything we do over the day, we, we can be prayerful so that it helps in our japa the next day. Okay, yes. So arranging our life so that we can be Krishna conscious, and it should be in, in the service of Krishna, 22 hours, 2 hours for Japa and 22 hours in Krishna's service. Uh, um, we, we want to, of course, we want to avoid the modes of passion and ignorance and try to associate more in the mode of goodness. Hmm? Anything else? Yes, I think that's also a good point, an important okay. Now somebody has to put your microphone off, you have to mute, mute yourself, there's a lot of talk there in the background, please mute yourself.
So association is very helpful to chant the holy name. Certainly, if you, if you can get... Atmosphere like in front of the DT or Tulsi Maharani or Sacred River, it's favorable atmosphere also on this. Okay, so if you have a temple room, you have deities at home, go in front of the deities and chant. And if you have Tosi also, bring Tosi in and sit with Tosi and chant the holy name. Actually, Prabhupada, one time I was in New York, Prabhupada had his picture taken with Tosi. He said, this is all we need, Tosi and the holy name. So you chant the holy name and you worship Tosi. And that way you... Life is successful. Anything else? Uh, sitting in one place so that nobody come to disturb or keep mobile and other thing away from. Okay, okay. We mentioned here we're asking what good habits could we incorporate in our lives in order to improve our japa. So you're bringing up some good point which we already talked about that. The, 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 the mobile phone, the, it's a good idea to like switch it off or put it away or something. Don't take calls during your japa period, right? Turn off your mobile phone, uh, put it out of sight, get it away from you. Leave it at home or something, leave it in your car or somewhere. Get rid of it. It's a good habit. Regulated food style and sleeping on time. What's that now? Regulated food, eating of the food at right time and then sleeping on time, light dinner. Okay, yes. Good habits. They want to wake up early in the morning. Better you don't eat heavy food at night. When I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement, I was told Srila Prabhupada had instructed no devotee should eat grains after four o'clock in the afternoon. No grains after four o'clock in the afternoon. And actually many temples, they won't serve prasadam in the evening. They only serve prasadam in the morning and lunchtime. In the evening, no prasadam. Just some hot milk is there. Maybe some guest comes, a life member or something, we can give him some Mahaprasada. But we don't usually have the habit of serving heavy meals to devotees in the evening because it makes it very difficult for them to wake up in the morning. So it's a good habit. Eat less at night and eat more. Eat your main meal in the daytime. Don't eat at night or eat less at night. Pranayama and exercise also helps. Exercise. Well, you can get a lot of pranayama and exercise doing kirtan, dance in the kirtan. If you go to kirtan, chant and dance. That's a good pranayama. That's a good exercise. Chanting. To maintain us. What? Sorry, Maharaj. To maintain a sadhana chart and have, have it reported to someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can try. <laughs> you have to be honest <laughs> to do that. Okay. What do you do outside of your 16 rounds that nourishes your japa? And so someone brought up this point, you know, that our day should be Krishna conscious. 22 hours should be in the service of Krishna. So what could we do outside of the 16 rounds that nourishes your japa? Yes, what, what do you suggest? What nourishes our japa? Hearing, uh, hearing uh, lectures yes. uh, from senior devotees yes. and uh, help get the help, take advices from them. Yes, also sir. engaging in other various sevas that keep us motivated throughout the day. Yes, especially we need to hear the scriptures, we need to hear the philosophy. That will nourish our japa. If we hear the, the philosophy about the holy name, it will help us to chant better. And what do you consider, to? what do you do outside of the 16 rounds that hinders the japa? In other words, what are the bad things for our japa? 
blasphemy others doing fault finding of devotees okay uh, getting angry laziness so yes what thinking getting angry to the family members getting angry arguing passion Uh, associating with materialistic people associating with non devotees yes okay so these are things which don't help our japa mm-hmm. all right going ahead there's text number 11 someone like to read nirnita decided to According to Sri Shukadev Goswami, this way of attaining success is an established fact, concluded not only by him but also by all other previous acharyas. Therefore, there is no need of further evidence. Sri Madhavatam two one point one one four. All right. So, what is the way of success? constant chanting of the holy name yes right anukirtanam hari naam anukirtanam constant chanting of the holy name and so this is accepted by the acharyas and there's no need of further evidence it's stated here shrimad bhagavatam so someone brought up the point that blasphemy can be very bad it can harm our chanting we criticize devotees nonstant talking talking a lot of prajalpa mm. so here's a statement could someone please read this for us dealing with blasphemy quoting from markande puran shri goswami ji says that one should neither blaspheme the devotee of the lord nor indulge in hearing others who are engaged in belittling a devotee of the lord a devotee should try to restrain the will fear by cutting out his tongue and being unable to commit uh, being unable to do so one should commit suicide rather than hear the blaspheming of the devotee of the lord shrimad bhagavatam 2.1.1 <laughs> all right so that we don't want to hear we don't want to hear the blasphemy of the devotees and we don't want to we don't want to blaspheme them and we don't want to hear others blaspheme devotees we don't want to hear blasphemy and we don't want to speak any blasphemy either it's not good for us and here you can see that the shastras actually say that to stop people from committing that kind of blasphemy we should be willing to cut out their tongue but of course we're, we're not encouraged to do that in this day but said that the you you can you, you should commit suicide rather than hear the blasphemy of the devotee of course we don't want to do commit suicide either because devotees are like brahmanas and so kill a brahmana is not good right and we don't want to be the have the sin of killing a brahmana that's very bad for us so what we should do we leave that place or get away from that place don't want to be near it and that's important for us there was one devotee his name was vamsi das baba ji he was a great devotee in the time of bhakti siddhanta sarasati prabhupad so this vamsi das baba ji he would never hear any blasphemy or any criticism or others if people would come to him and if they if they would say to him what do you think of the government he would simply say oh govardhan he would change it from the government he wouldn't hear government he would just hear govardhan so like that that's one way of uh, avoiding hearing blasphemy we just you know people were talking something negative we can make it krishna conscious if you're very expert otherwise easiest thing is just get away run away <laughs> i'm sorry i have to go i have no time don't stay to hear and don't encourage them with their prajalpa just 
keep away from them. All right, and then Sukadeva Goswami then goes on, he gives an example about Gadvanga Maharaj. And it's a nice example, an important example, Gadvanga Maharaj. And his example is very relevant in the case of Maharaj Parikshit, right? Why is this important for Maharaj Parikshit? First of all, you all know who Gadvanga Maharaj is, right? Gadvanga, yes. Gadvanga Maharaj, what, what happened to him? He had only a few moments left. Why? So he did not. What had he been doing? What had Gadvanga Maharaj been doing? He had been fighting for long and then he, was, he wanted to rest or something. Who was he fighting for? Who was he fighting for? Who was he fighting against? Demigod. He was fighting for demigods against. Right, he was fighting for the demigods, right? And uh, the demigods were, were pleased with him. He did well. He fought well on their behalf against the demons. But then Kartikeya came. So when Kartikeya came, then they told Kartvanga Maharaj, okay, now you can have a rest, we don't need you anymore. Kartikeya is here and he'll be the general. So Kartvanga Maharaj was relieved. And they said, yeah, we want to reward you. And so he, he, they said, we'll give you a benediction, some benediction. But Kartvanga Maharaj said, just tell me, how long have I got remaining? And then they, the demigods told them, you have only a moment. You have only a moment of time. So it said that Kadvanga Maharaj, he had gone there to the heavenly planets to fight for the demigods against the demons. So when he got that news that he only had a moment, he immediately came down to the earth. And he came down to the earthly abode and he immediately sat and fixed his mind on the, on the Lord and gave up his body. And this way he left the world and went to the supreme abode. So he came down to this abode because he under, if he was on the heavenly planet, so there's too much attraction, too much opulence on the heavenly planets. He thought, it would be better for me to go back to the earthly abode. And from the earthly abode he can easily concentrate on the Lord and go back to God. So this example was very relevant because Maharaj Parikshit is there, and Maharaj Parikshit, he has seven days. So Maharaj Parikshit may be thinking that, oh, you know, I don't have, I don't have much time. Do I have enough time? Am I going to be? Is it is it time enough for me to, to to, uh, to become perfect in this? Because I have to hear and I have to chant, I have to remember, is seven days going to be enough for me? So Sukadeva Goswami tells Maharaj Parikshit about Kadvanga Maharaj, that you don't have to worry, you've got a lot of time, you've got seven days. Kadvanga Maharaj only had a moment, but he could get success. He just took advantage of that one moment. So it's, it's not the long life which is important. And so you can see at the, the bottom of the page here, we see better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. A long life. We see uh, examples of trees which have a long life. Trees have a very long, some trees live for hundreds and some trees live thousands of years. But what is their consciousness? Most trees generally, they have very low, very stunted consciousness. They have to, to be in the body of a tree. It's very limited consciousness. So, Srila Prabhupada says, better a moment of full consciousness 
than a long life of illusion. And so people think, oh, it's very great, live a long life, if you can live to be 100 years, oh, very wonderful. But 100 years is nothing. In Kali Yuga, people don't live very long, live 100 years. In the pre previous age, Dwapara Yuga, people lived 1,000 years. In Treta Yuga, they were living 10,000 years. And in such a yuga, they had a life of 100,000 years. So just think, what is our life in the Kali Yuga? It's very short, temporary, 70 years, your life is finished. Any, anything over 70 years, then it's a bonus. Time is up. And so it's not the duration of life which is important but it's the consciousness which is important. So Prabhupada explaining this important point here in relation to Katvanga Maharaj, because we may think, well, Katvanga Maharaj, you know, oh, he shouldn't have died, he should have lived longer. If he'd lived longer, he could have done more. But it's not so much how long you live, but what's important is the consciousness which we have. We do want to have the proper consciousness. So even a moment of full consciousness is good for us. All right, so here's another exercise here for you today. We ask you to evaluate that above statement with other scriptural evidence. All right, which statement? Better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. Do you, we want to hear from you. Does this support the scriptures? Are there any evidence in the scriptures which is contrary to this? We want, you can see the purpose of this exercise is to help students develop analytical, interpretive and evaluative skills, particularly in respect of the practical application of Shastric knowledge. Consider apparently conflicting references and to still draw conclusions consistent consistent with both so this these kind of things are going on constantly maybe you're a member of different groups or forums and they're discussing different controversial issues for example there's controversial issues about things like female diksha gurus you know, it's a controversial issue. Some people are very much opposed and other people are in favour. Oh, so we have to discuss these things on the basis of scripture. So here's another quote. Today we're not considering female Diksha Gurus. Today we're just talking about, is a moment of full consciousness really better than a long life of illusion? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, so we see in, uh, like when uh, Lord performs uh, his Valya Leela, so that time uh, uh, to Yashoda Mata, he, uh, he shows the uh, multiple times the whole cosmos. But, uh, uh, but Mata, Yashoda Mata want to stay in illusion because he want to treat the Lord as his son. And you always thought that this is because of uh, uh, some uh, negative energy that is affecting her. So she always, always wanted it to be, of course, covered by yoga maya in order to, and that is what this Lord wanted to enjoy the uh, uh, motherly uh, love. And, and that's the reason probably Lord has covered her with yoga maya. But here again, the same was the situation with Gopi. Gopis never 
accepted Lord as as uh, the uh, 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 supreme uh, 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 reality of Godhead, but you always uh, treated him like though he is, they said it multiple times that he may be God, but for us he is uh, just uh, Nanda Nandan, uh, 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 and they wanted to be always immersed in the loving services. Okay. I'm just trying to relate what you said to this verse, though. Uh, are you saying that the, that the consciousness of the gopis and the consciousness of Mother Yasoda was was illusory under the influence of Yoga Maya? Or yes, were, Maharaj. Were, because, in, uh, because the moment you would have thought of that they are the uh, uh, Supreme Father, so they, uh, their relations would have been imme momentarily immediately changed, their behavior uh, would have changed. So they have been always under, uh, uh, because of Yoga Maya, uh, they never treated that is the uh, Supreme Father. And they always love to treat uh, them as a uh, uh, small child. And that is what the Lord also wanted. So sometimes this uh, Lord deliberately want uh, to very sincere devotees or eternal associates that there should not be in a consciousness that, uh, uh, that he is the uh, Lord himself. And so that he can enjoy the different mellows. Okay. The, but... Th that's a very special consciousness. You see that that kind of consciousness, where, where it's the, the illusion, the, the 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 consciousness of Mother Yasoda and the Gopis, their consciousness, you could say, under Yoga Maya, there's some kind of illusion there. They're seeing Krishna as their lover, as their son. So. Yeah, that that is that is full consciousness. So that's they've come to that position by the result of all their well, they're, because they're perfect, they're perfect devotees. They're not ordinary. They're not mixed devotees. They're pure devotees. So they have full consciousness. So that consciousness in loving Krishna is certainly better than the long life of illusion. The life of the materialist, the materialistic people who, you know, there were so many people, they also saw Krishna, but they could not understand Krishna as the Supreme Lord. And we saw, we saw different demons, how they came and they challenged Krishna. So Prabhu is making the point that the gopis, mother, Yashoda, they had full consciousness and they could relish the highest rasa with Krishna. But the materialists, they come to Krishna, they come to Krishna and they challenge Krishna. Like it was, was it Pundraka? He came to Krishna, he told Krishna that I'm the Supreme Lord. You should give that Sudarsan Chakra to me. I'm God. So Krishna gave him Sudarshan Chakra, he cut off his head with it. Demons, did long life of illusion, demons like Sishupal and Dantavakra, they were uh, uh, always envious of Krishna, challenging Krishna. So the long life of illusion. Kamsa course was an illusion. He always wanted to kill Krishna. But the devotees, even if they just have a moment, what is some scriptural evidence about that? Any verses from the scriptures? Yes, there's one verse in the Bhagavad Gita, a little advancement made. 
Yes. What's the verse? Translation. In this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution, and a little advancement made saves us from the greatest danger. So even a moment to full con a little advancement, svopam apyasya dharmasya. Yes? Yes? So who's got their hands up here? Duty Gopi, you got your hand up here for this? Um, yes, Maharaj. Um, I just wanted to give the example of Narad Muni. Like, he just saw a lot for a tiny second, you know, just a fraction of a second, and he got that moment of self-realization, and he realized what he has missed upon. Like, earlier he was searching for, uh, this, like, basically the Lord, and once when, just for a tiny fraction of a second, he got darshans of the Lord with Maya, and that's when he started crying and he developed that taste, urge to see Lord again and again. So just, it was just a moment of full consciousness, which, you know, covered his change, transformed his whole life. Just seeing the Lord and then he wanted to see him more often. Yes, right. Yes. That was before he became Narada Muni. Yes, when he was a little boy. Right. Okay, thank you. Yes, and Diksha Ahuja Prabhu? Diksha Prabhu has got his hand up? No response. Chaitanya Hari Prabhu? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, can we take the example of Ajamina, where he wasted his whole life at the last moment? Uh, he has some. Uh, not full consciousness, but some, some, uh, he, he's able to chant the name of the Lord. Can we take that as, as an example here? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you chant the name of the Lord? At the end of, of course, he'd been chanting throughout his life, actually. He didn't just only chant at the end of his life, but he'd been chanting regularly. He'd been ch saying the name of his son constantly. Right. So he chanted the name of the Lord many times, although he never thought he was chanting the name. It was always in Namabha. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, in 7.30 Bhagavad Gita, it is mentioned that those in full consciousness of me, who know me, the Supreme Lord, to be the governing principle of the material manifestation, of the demigods and of all methods of sacrifice can understand and know me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even at the time of death. Okay. I was thinking also the verse about Sadhu Sangha. It says, Lava Matra Sadhu Sangi Sarvas. Just a moment, even a fraction of a second, one eleventh of a second, Lava Matra. But it's enough to get perfection with the association with the devotees. Yes, and uh, Prabhu, uh, Bhak, uh, Bhakta uh, Maharaja, Bhakta Prem Swami? Uh, Maharaj, uh, King Kulishakar. Oh, yes. Krishna, Tadiya, Pada, Pankaja, Panjarantam, Paddui, Me, Vishuddhu, Manusha, Raja, so, what's Maharaj Kadvanga saying? My Lord, yeah, Shabar Kulishikar saying, My Lord Krishna, I pray that. Oh, Kulishikar, yeah. My, my mind is sink now today. If I live long time, 
we are unable to remember at the time of death. But at least I can remember now. This moment, one moment is enough. Mm. Ah, right. So that supports this statement, right? Katvanga said, no need to live a long time. Let me die now while I can still chant. Also, you can see practical life. The Prabhupada got little association of his speech of Masha Bhakti Siddhanta Shatashati Shatashati. But so many other people got a lot of association. But Prabhupada took a lot of advantage of his spiritual master association. Uh -huh. Yes. Association. Thank you. Okay, and then Prabhu also has his some yes. Uh, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. So I was thinking about the example of Bharat Maharaj, you know, who who for a momentarily lo lost his uh, focus from bhakti and had to spend a life of uh, uh, full deer, you know. So contrary, but uh, you know, bit of contrary to the statement, but uh, you know, kind of emphasizing how staying attentive all the time to devotional service is important. So, we don't have to waste our life in full occupation. So, Bharat Maharaj example I was thinking about. Maybe we can, you can enlighten more on this. Can we consider this? You mean Bharat Maharaj when he's Jad Bharat or when he was in the Gand up at the when was, Yeah, when he got uh, illusioned by the deer, you know, so, so he has spent a life of devotional service he has reached to the bhava stage, but then just because he got inattentive to that because of the deer's association, and then his fall down happened. You know, it was a little kind of a momentary, uh, kind of, I don't know, momentary, but it was for a short period. He was having a life of devotional service, but for a short moment, he lost his attention, and then he had to take a birth as a deer. You know, and then he had to spend the entire life of deer. It should be considered as, uh, you know, uh, judd life, uh, uh, kind of life of illusion. Although he was in consciousness by the mercy of the Lord, so, but he had to stay in the life of a deer. And then in the next life, he become Jad Bharata again to revive his Krishna consciousness. Yes, yeah, it's a warning how careful we have to be not to get distracted. Okay, Prabhu, thank you. Yeah. Someone else has got a hand up here? This is... Yes, Premananda Gopinath. Yes, Maharaj, can you take the example of the Murari in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita? The Murari, he was, uh, he was killing the animals. He was half killing them. And he was taking pleasure in that. And when he got association of uh, Narmamuni, he became a devotee. Yes, okay. So a moment's association, a little association with Narada Muni changed him, got him to give up all his sinful activities and bad habits. Okay, wait. Just to finish off this section on Dealing with blasphemy, here's some points. There are three ways of dealing with such insults. If someone in hearing is heard blaspheming by words, one should be so expert that he can defeat the opposing party by argument. If he is unable to defeat the opposing party, then the next step is that he should not just stand there meekly, but should give up his life. And the third process is followed if he is unable to execute the above-mentioned two processes, and that is one must leave the place and go away. If a devotee does not follow any of the above-mentioned three processes, he falls down from his position of devotee. That is from the Nectar of Devotion, Chapter 9. So, of course, we want to learn to leave if there's some blasphemy going on. You don't want to hear it. And we don't want to encourage people with blasphemy. 
If nobody's around, then they'll be quiet. They have nobody to talk to. If we stay and listen to them, then they talk blasphemy. Then we're guilty also. We become culpable. We become, we have to take some reaction because we're hearing the blasphemy. So don't allow ourselves to hear. Run away. People are talking blasphemy. And offending devotees, that's the most serious, the first offence, right? To blaspheme devotees. Who are you offending? What is causing you to make offensive, offensive, what is causing you to make offences or be critical of this devotee? What attitude must you adopt to stop being critical? What must you change within yourself to adopt these proper attitudes? Right? Who are you offending? Well, who are we offending? Offending devotees? Well, sometimes we think, oh, he's not really a devotee. I'm a devotee, but he's not a devotee. So that is very bad, to have that mentality that we minimize the position of others, we criticize them, we say they're not devotees. What is causing us to make offenses or be critical of the devotee? Often what's causing us is simply envy, our own envious attitude, that we're jealous or envious of someone, that they've done something which we don't like and, or we, we envy, they're doing something we wanted to do, they're doing better than us and we criticize them, we try to pull them down. What attitude must you adopt to stop being critical? Well, we have to be repentant. We have to, first of all, understand that it's not good to criticize devotees. That's the first thing. And we have to understand that by criticizing devotees, it's causing great harm to our own devotion. And what do we have to change within ourselves to adopt these proper attitudes? We have to change the heart. We have to look at our own self and see the faults in ourselves, not see the faults in others. Try to be critical of our own self rather than being critical of others. This is the idea. But certainly very serious, very harmful. In what way can we offend devotees if we criticize them by, on the basis of their birth or we criticize them on the basis of something they did before they were devotees or we criticize them on something which they did a long time ago when before they had any, uh, you know, maybe they did something just by chance, uh, un unknowingly, without proper thinking. They did something. So if we criticize people on that basis, then that's an offense. So we have to be very careful not to criticize devotees. It's very serious. And Lord Chaitanya spoke about this a lot. So be very conscious not to offend devotees. And as we heard today, Maharaji said, how to avoid offending devotees appreciate them and glorify them and see the good in them. That is how we can avoid offending devotees. The conclusion is that one should neither hear nor allow vilification of a devotee of the Lord. From the purport of 12th verse. All right, we're going to stop here today. Are there any questions or comments? So today we spoke about. Yes. Okay. Just now you give that three way of uh, how to avoid from uh, involving in listening the devotees. Uh, Sometimes uh, we we are faced situation where uh, we are trying to uh, get and give association to some devotees who have gone through a difficult situation, but they are still. Uh, uh, indulging in that uh, things happen many years back, how to avoid so that at the same time we are not going to I mean, try to engage them back in our devotional life or engage back in scorn, for example. Sometimes we are in retreat, sometimes we are being, they get they already like frustrated 
we also many things. So how to, uh, we, we, we don't want to hear the blessing, but they, they are still have that mentality. Well, you have to overcome that by simply hearing and chanting, by having a strong program of Krishna Kata, having kirtan, nice kirtan, a lot of kirtan, and also classes, reading from the scriptures and discussing the philosophy, these things only. This is the process to help people get over these things which are there in their heart. Because people are not hearing and chanting, and so they have these things in their heart. So you, you want to help them, the best help you can give them is to give them a Krishna conscious atmosphere and get them to start hearing and chanting. Help them to get a taste for the holy name. If they can get some taste for the holy name, or if they can get some interest in the philosophy, then they can give up all these things, all these uh, things which are there in their heart from the past. Okay, Maharaj, thank you very much, Maharaj. This is a, this hearing and chanting is a real medicine for the disease of material conditioned life. And so the more we propagate the spiritual sound vibration, the holy name, good kirtan, and then reading the scriptures together, discussing it, I'll let them hear about Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada's life, activities, or different acharyas, somehow or other, get them absorbed in Krishna consciousness. Because the fact that they're, they've got these doubts, these problems in their mind, this is because they're on the bodily platform. You have to bring them off the bodily platform. You have to give them Krishna consciousness. So the pure spiritual atmosphere is very important. You want to help people come into Krishna consciousness, you've got to have that nice atmosphere. Nice kirtan and then nice prasadam also. Giving them also very nice tasty prasadam is very important. That can really help people a lot to change their hearts. So these, these are loving exchanges. And the more you have loving exchanges with these devotees, then the more they can overcome these kind of tendencies. But so you have to be willing to reach out to them. You know, make nice arrangements. Okay. Sometimes also you can honor them, you know, give them flower garlands, you know, put a flower garland around their neck and you know, let them feel wanted, feel appreciated. Mm. You will always get people coming, have, they have some problems, they have some doubts, they have something from the past, they didn't like something. Okay, okay. But if they have, if you have the strong Krishna conscious program, it can all be forgotten about. I'm trying to get them to come even to Mayapur, get some association. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, association is very important. All right, if there's no more questions, then we'll meet tomorrow and we'll go on with the rest of this chapter. Hare Krishna Maharaj, so can we also have the uh, these slides, so that uh, yes, uh, you can have them. When we're finished, when I go through the yes. class, then you can have them. That's why. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'll meet you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Gorbhakta Vrinda, Ki Jai.
हरे कृष्ण भक्ति विघ्न विनाश निश्चय